Welcome to Maker Camp. Today's guest, we're going to explore the intersection between science, food, and fun. That's right, we're going to talk with Emily Baltz and explore all the ideas that she's had that involves making things with music and ice cream. That sounds like so much fun. And we've got a group of young campers from the Hilton Head Island Boys and Girls Club. And we're going to check in with our counselors about the daily project Shake Ice Cream. So get excited and let's make something great. Thank you for joining us. I'm Camp Director Paloma. And I'm Camp Director Burke. We're always excited to have you here today and for the next couple weeks of Maker Camp. And if you want to submit your questions or comments, feel free to head over to our Google Plus Maker Camp community page and we'll take a look at them later in the show. I can't wait to see the questions you come up with today's guests. And if you want to appear live with us in the future, like we have the affiliates with us today, you can go to the affiliate information page and fill out the form. Now, before we get to today's guests, why don't we uh, hang out with our uh, counselors and see what today's project's all about. Camp counselors, how's it going? Hey everybody, I'm Enrique. And I'm Consola Pia. Hello. Um, like every day, we show what you've been working on. And today, we have got some um, guest makers from uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Hilton Head Island who are going to tell us um, about, the, about the project. Um, thank you for joining us. What have you been working on? Oh, um, hi. My name is Alejandra, and uh, this summer I made a mini foosball table. That looks so great. I love the lines. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it was fairly easy to make, um, but overall I really enjoyed this experience of putting it all together. So, yeah. It looks That's so great. Nice. What, was, what did you learn? Um, well... There's a lot of small parts to it, so it's like, it's like, um, it's really hard, kind of, easy, but, sorry. So, if, if there was something that you would do different if you had to make the project next time, what would you try out? Um, what is it? What would you do different next time? Oh, I would make it a little bit bigger. Yeah. <laughs> you would make your mini foosball taper bigger. I you like it. Into a full size one, maybe? Or? Yeah, but you'd still call it a mini <laughs> foosball taper. Just still call it a mini, Just yeah. use one of those really tiny, tiny foosballs. And then, yeah, no, I love it. I love it. It looks so great, too. I love the use of color. Thank you. So, what was your favorite part about this project in total? Um. Well, I liked playing it afterward because with the other person. So, that's the fun part of it. You gotta yeah. play. Yeah, definitely. It looks it looks like a lot of fun. We've seen so many people just absolutely just loving this project. I, I it's so simple, like you wouldn't really think about it, but I, it's it's really fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing with us. You're welcome. Thank you. And so, what else do we have here? Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Joy. My name is Maria. My name is Diana. And my name is Michelle. <laughs> what have you made for us? Our project our project is this little operation game that that with your fits. You touch the olive foil and it makes this little little sound. Very nice. cool. So what did you make them out of? We made these well, we made the little twists out of out of little, out of tape, olive foil, straws, a wire, and rubber bands and a piece of wire. And we made this with a caprice with a little dog. Um, Looks so good, and we could use like the big old boxes. Yeah. I've seen people do this using. Uh, using cardboard, using paper, using wood. You can come up with some really cool designs. Yeah, what's really nice about these kind of projects is that you can use a variety of materials to accomplish the same goal, which is also a really good thing to bring home with uh, some of the things that we have uh, put out there for you. Uh, it's not always just the uh, parts list that we provide. You can you know, mix and match them and come up with new ways to do something. 
Yeah, and most of the stuff you have lying around your house. Like, I have a cardboard box at home. I've got some aluminum foil. I should make one of these when I get home. Yeah, what's stopping us? I know, right? So let's see if we can get a demonstration of how they work. Very nice. nice. Very effective. <laughs> I would definitely <laughs> not want to. I would be very motivated to get the little piece out of there because it would be. I would not want to hear the, the loud alarm sound. <laughs> so, what was the most fun that you had while making this project? The most fun I had about making this project is making the sound. <laughs> yeah. Now, is this one of your uh, one of your first electronics projects? Yes. Pretty much. And I want to see the one on the right. It looks a little bit different. So what's what's that one? Because I can see that we've got the Capri Sun boxes, but uh, what are you, let's see, oh, and maybe it's your left. It's orange and there's holes in it? Um, it's just a little bit different. It doesn't have the buzzer. It just has a light instead of a buzzer. Yeah. So when we touch ours with the tweezers, the light goes on. Uh, sweet. That's a good modification. I like that idea. And it's a little bit less uh, jarring than the, the speaker. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of, you know, just like the original operation. With the nose. Oh, yeah, they had the nose. So yeah. You could make your own actual operation game. Well, thank you so much for sharing your project with us. They look great, and I'm so happy that you had fun. And let's head back to the counselors to hear about today's fun project that you guys can do at home as well. Um, yeah, so um, thank you uh, for throwing that. Uh, um, and, um, so what's today's project? In the middle. Uh, so, okay, so um, no, you're right. Yeah. Um, Compass, uh, we want to see uh, your project of uh, this summer. Uh, so take pictures and video of uh, what you're working on, and uh, we show them. Uh, we will show them on the community page. Uh, show us what you made, what you learned, and uh, what you're going to make next. Yep. So today's daily project is shake ice cream, like Paloma said earlier. Uh, it's a pretty simple project, and it's suitable for all skill levels. It's just got a few basic ingredients. You need milk, you need sugar, cream, uh, salt, and ice. And this is totally optional, but you can add imitation vanilla, you can add chocolate chips, you can add... Even yeah. Nutella, which is Pierre's favorite, you can add fruit. It's, uh, it's all up to you. This is a super fun product. So along with those ingredients, you need two Ziplocs. You need a small Ziploc to put your wet ingredients in, and a larger Ziploc, which is kind of going to be your shell. And you put in salt and ice. And when those two mix together, they get very cold, and that's what causes the liquid ingredients to solidify. And so, uh, so I've got an example here. Uh, so you can see the wet ingredients inside in the smaller Ziploc and the ice on the outside. And so last but not least, it does get a little cold, so it's good to have a friend that you can throw it to like this. Yeah, so uh, come for that's your turn. Post pictures of your project, and uh, we'll share them on the Hangout tomorrow. Woo! Over to you at Make a Camp HQ. <laughs> that sounds like it's so much fun. Yeah, Pierre's got the right idea there, uh, campers. If you want... Uh, if you're going to upload some of these, I'd like to see some creative shaking to make that ice cream. Yeah, let's see a video of that going on. And actually, I made this when I was younger, and I used a small coffee can inside of a really large coffee can, and then we kicked it around the street. <laughs> Although we forgot to tape it closed, so it was more of an ice cream explosion. So maybe remember that while you're messing around with it to secure your ice cream, but it is really fun. So you can use any two containers as long as one goes inside of the other. But I'm not going to stall anymore because we've got this awesome guest today and we're going to have so much fun. Our next guest is going to talk with us about exploring human technology and the science of food. So when you have, sit down and have lunch, what is that lunch, what's the story that that lunch is telling you? What's happening in your brain while you're eating it? Well, our next guest might have a lot of information for us to swallow, but hopefully we won't uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, get it in bite-sized pieces. So <laughs> let's welcome on our next guest, Emily Baltz. Welcome to Maker Camp. Hey, how are you? We're really good. How are you? I'm great. I'm in a large, giant warehouse in Omaha, Nebraska. As you should be. <laughs> It yeah. just sounds like a great place to uh, make yeah. an experiment, yeah. Yeah, for a great place for a maker to be. <laughs> now, totally. now, Emily, what, what's really exciting for you 
about the, the human experience of food. Why don't we dive right into that? Yeah. What's so great, I think, is that as human beings, we are actually the first computers. So we are our own technology. The way that we experience food is through our senses, and those senses are kind of like the bells and whistles of our inner program. And that's actually the only way that we're able to really taste food. Without that stuff, they're like our little receptors, our little sensors, we wouldn't actually be able to experience the world and actually wouldn't be able to eat that delicious ice cream that I just saw flying across space. <laughs> so I, I hear that you have an experiment that you want us to, uh, to take part in. And can we be your test subjects? And by we, I mean Burke. <laughs> <laughs> well we done. Bowls here. Yeah, I, now I these... had zero preparation of this, so yeah, we have I... no idea what are in these bowls. By the way, campers, we're not we're not kidding. We have no idea what's going to happen. No here. clue whatsoever. So, can you walk us through this experiment? Yeah, for sure. So, Burke, since you very kindly volunteered to be the lab subject of today's <laughs> that did. yes, I you did. Up. He definitely cool. volunteered. I didn't force him to do this at all. Um, no coercion <laughs> necessary. Great. So, Paloma is going to place a few things in your mouth. We'll start with the bowl on your right side, Paloma, that has the spoon over it. Now, don't oh, open it yet. Like you'll I... need to close your eyes, and Burke, you'll need to pinch your nose shut. Now, pinch it really hard so we can't. you can't smell, right? Not a smell. Right. Mouth. I, okay, I good. I definitely smell like I'm in a balloon now. I love this it's so much excellent. already. Excellent. Now, Paloma, you have to, yeah, yeah, yeah that stuff. You put one spoonful in Burke's mouth, and Burke, you're going to chew it. Just kind of savor the texture, swish it around your mouth, but don't swallow. Just sit there with the stuff in your mouth. Okay, are you ready, Burke? Yeah, I guess so. Do you want airplane or choo-choo train? Um, I'm going to go with the airplane. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Oh, there you go. There you go. Oh, it's so <laughs> good. It's kind of mushy, a little grainy. Now, Burke, before you swallow, we want you to unpinch your nose. What are you eating? I believe that's applesauce. Why? Yes, you are correct. Boom. Now, do, I get, do I get a free car now? <laughs> you get a free radish sitting right here. No, uh, the actually, funny that's, part... That's not bad. <laughs> Radish. radish and applesauce. Now well, the I, limits... I tend to settle as I go, so you know, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things that I adapt quickly to. <laughs> the radish will turn into a Porsche, don't worry. So the... <laughs> <laughs> now, as long as it's not a lemon. Nah. <laughs> well, now well, what... I could see your reaction to that joke. <laughs> you can open your eyes for one moment now. Okay. We'll talk about what just happened. Because what the campers don't know, what actually neither Paloma nor I know, is actually what goes on inside of Burke when he goes like this and chews. Now, I'm guessing that you couldn't really taste what you were eating until you unplugged your nose. Is that what happened? Uh, pretty much. I, I could taste the granulation and the texture, and like I could feel that. And it kind of narrowed it down in my mind, like if I had a wall of, of choices, I did narrow it down to like a few, but it wasn't until I opened my nose that I could tell immediately that it was applesauce. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the amazing part of human technology, is that without our sense of smell, we actually can't taste anything. So this is a great trick to do, and I mean, you could do it for breakfast, you could do it for lunch, you could do it for dinner. See actually how your sense of smell affects what you're tasting. So that's a really neat way to be able to check out and kind of fine-tune our own human technology. Now the second small analog experience that we will do is a... Eyes closed once again. Now, Burke, okay. for this one, you're going to have to plug your ears. Do you want to plug my ears for this one? Yeah, plug yeah, your ears. Gonna close your eyes. I'm not going to be able to hear you from this on out. Well, no, yeah, don't... Oh, well, no, yeah, because you don't want to hear anything. So. Yeah, if I don't want to hear anything, I can't really... I'll tap you when I'm about to. Speak. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna descend into the world of the unknown. I'll tell and him close my he, ears. The, uh, the things if he needs. Okay, so Burke is completely. We can now make fun of Burke, and he can't. Yeah. Hear us. I can't God, hear his anything. His hair is going, amazing. Yeah. That. <laughs> so Paloma, you'll have to put some of the food in Burke's mouth. Okay, so let's see if we can we can show the campers what that is. Yeah. Okay. 
I'm about to feed you. Okay, choo 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 in the sand. Chugga 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 chugga. There you go. <laughs> I hope you now, can see the kind of hesitation <laughs> that he started with there. <laughs> So the neat part here for us that are watching Burke is that he's actually having a stereo surround sound experience inside of his head Ooh. by chewing popcorn. It's something that we never do. We never just plug our ears and listen to ourselves chew. Maybe we can bump Burke to see what his feedback is. You're good. Okay. Okay. Now Put I'll your work. ears back in. I'm, okay, they're, they're installed, my ears. Yes, you can. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I imagine you like, plug your <laughs> ears back on. Yeah, we, I meant put your... So I can put, hear what, what Emily has to say about that. Yeah. Yeah. We're high tech here. We're so we're advanced. Totally. <laughs> we're in the future now, today. Yeah, Burke okay. is a totally connected human. Yes, <laughs> I am To now, another now, planet. I am now engaged. <laughs> Amazing. Now we can really speak to each other. Yes. So something that happens there, too, is another part of our senses that we rarely think about is we chew all the time. But actually, what food designers will do is they will engineer the sound of something. A really great experiment is do it with popcorn, stale popcorn, and fresh popcorn. And if you just listen into it, you can actually hear the different crunchinesses. And the crunchiness actually communicates to our brain and tells us if something is fresh or stale, good for us wow. or bad for us. And so it's a really wow. interesting way to start becoming more aware of how other things communicate to our brain while we eat. It's not just our tongue, it's not just flavor, but it's also kind of the, the sound and the, what if you have a playlist that our food is playing while we eat that tells us, that gives us other cues too about what's good and what's not good. So those are two simple little examples that you can do all the time at home with yourself, with your friends, have a party. Yeah, campers, okay, if anybody, like, if anybody forgot to show up on time for the Hangout today, you now have a tool before they get to watch the show, is you have to run these experiments on them. That's the punishment for being late. <laughs> it, it, it's I, I funny, yeah. so it's... much fun watching you eat that popcorn. And I, like, I'm sure what you What am did. I putting in my mouth? <laughs> I'm not prepared. I, I, I usually don't, uh, you know... Uh, Close my eyes when I eat something. And, and plug your so, ears. And plug my ears. Yeah. I, I would have you know I've never eaten lunch like that. So. Well, it's Maybe great. <laughs> yeah, but today is a new day. So, yes, we, it looks lunch like we will. Lunch like this. Yeah, lunch is like this, campers. Try that and then try one with your nose and, and you'll, you'll sound slightly funny. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, thank you so much for showing us that little bit of a food hack right there. Um, now, you said you have a demonstration for us. Uh, would you like to guide us through that? I do. So there's a couple things that we'll go through today. One way is to design. So when we talk about food design, all the food design is is a way to actually be able to design better experiences for you, for I, for us, using food and drink. So today what I thought would be interesting to do is to learn how to make our own soda flavors, soda syrups. So this is actually a really old process that dates back to like the pre-Middle Ages and it's something that's called an oxymel. And an oxymel was a potion, if you will have it, that consists of a few ingredients. Honey, apple cider vinegar, and then herbs of your choosing. So I happen to have some herbs here in front of me from my friend Amanda's garden that's just across the street. And I picked up some sage. This is rosemary. And whoa, she's growing lemongrass. It mm. smells really good. So the that. great thing is, is that you can make these. They're totally natural. If you grow stuff in your garden, you can just go and pick them. Or you can go to your grocery store and look at what different herbs might attract you. I really like to smell all of them. So you figure out which one you like. I really like the smell of sage. It's a little bit kind of peppery. And I really like the way this lemongrass smells. It's so good. So you'll also need a jar of sorts. And what we're going to do is we're actually just going to put the herbs in here. And then we're going to add some vinegar and some honey to it. And what happens, so first I take my, you can use a jar kind of of any size, anything that's going to let this infuse. Because what we'll do is we'll mix all of this together. I put herbs, 
this is going to be a unique experiment. And the great thing is, is you can just continue to experiment. You could even do this with a series of five jars and try to figure out what combinations are interesting to you. Sometimes combos are good. Sometimes they're sort of weird. But you only know by testing and experimenting. So I take the jar. And then what we'll want to do is we start with some honey. And the easy equation is two parts honey, one part uh, vinegar. So you just fill it up like that. This honey bear is going to be pretty empty pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> so you drizzle, 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 drizzle honey in. And you want to get it to a point where, there you go. You see how that's starting to happen? Your herbs are getting stuck in there. Now the interesting part of this formula is actually that what's happening is that the honey is the preservative. The honey is going to catch all the stuff that the vinegar here is going to draw out of these herbs. So every herb alongside having really delicious flavors also has a bunch of essential oils stuck in them. So their skin, just like our human skin, has oils in it to lubricate it, to help it bend. But that oil is actually what traps the flavor. So what the vinegar does is the vinegar is pulling out the oil and the honey captures it. It's a pretty easy metaphor if you think of it. Honey's sticky. It's catching all this stuff. Mm. So our next part is the fun part. Today, I guess, is also shaking day. Make sure your lid is screwed on really hard. And then you have to shake it really hard. Yeah, you want to get... Honey. It's really thick, so you got to really get in there. You have to really shake it a lot. And see, it starts to get all liquidy. Mm. And then you put it aside. And you're going to let it sit that way for about a week, two weeks, as dense as you want the flavor. The longer you let it sit, the denser the flavor will be. And then you'll open it up and strain it off so we don't keep any of the herbs in there. We just get the liquid. And then you can add it to your favorite seltzer. You could try it with some iced tea, anything. I like to put it in little bottles. This is just like a little apple juice bottle. And suddenly you have your own natural custom soda flavors that are actually made just from this little extraction process that actually the Greeks used. And now you can make it yourself. So this is a really fun, it's a cool summer project, and it's something that you can use from your neighbor's garden, your garden, or grocery stores anywhere. Mm, that's also a really great gift idea, too. Like if you it's want to make so nice. And yeah. love handmade you know, gifts like that. So but if you want to make something really awesome for, like, for a birthday or for something like that, I would go for this. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. you do a lot of really cool stuff that you wouldn't really think of with food. So I think that we have a video of you using ice cream in a way that we would not <laughs> expect. Well, yes. <laughs> Are we going to play it now? Yeah, let's roll that video, and then you can tell us what we're looking at. Cool. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what were we just looking at? <laughs> so we were looking at Lickestra. It's the Licking Ice Cream Orchestra. And this is actually a project that I did with Carla Diana, who I think has been on the show a couple yeah. episodes ago. Yeah, so Carla and I are friends. And we made this project together. And it's a food and tech project. So both of us work, obviously, within design and art. And Carla is a technologist, and I specialize in food. So we got together, and we wanted to make a new interpretation of the ice cream stand. So what you see there is a series of four cones. Those cones are rapid prototyped. And inside, there are capacitive sensors. And those capacitive sensors communicate to a series of different tracks that we recorded with a musician named Aaron Dyer. And the second that your tongue connects to the ice cream, that actually completes the circuit. So every cone, every ice cream, becomes a part of a larger instrument, a part of a little orchestra, if you have. So when you start to lick, you actually start to play together. And that's actually the tough part. We have to practice a lot. We have to eat a lot of ice cream. I'm sure that that's a very challenging process. Very, very challenging, yeah. Extremely <laughs> laborious, yes. <laughs> so cool. 
I love that you used engineering and the, the passion for food in this kind of harmonious way. And I mean, we've seen a lot of stuff on the community page that uses food to make sound using like the makey makey that you like tap on the banana and now you have a banana piano. So that's a really cool use of that that I would not have thought of. And I love that he got some in his beard. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it's really going for fun. the full effect. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a great party trick, right? So if you even have like a bunch of your friends over and you could make it using a makey makey as well, right? You, there's almost a way to be able to tone it and so all of us can start playing together. It's that same idea that when Burke was like taking his sound away from the food, right? He was listening more to the food. What happens when we add another sound to the food? So we're always making orchestras with our body and sometimes with other objects around us. So sound is a really big part of an eating experience too. It makes us sometimes feel happy, it makes us feel sad, it makes us feel scared, it makes us feel calm. Those are neat ways to start testing how you react yourself to how you eat and how you want to eat. That's really fascinating. Yeah. My lunch is going to be so interesting. <laughs> yeah. Lunch right there. <laughs> so Every <I> meal. <laughs> Go ahead. We were going to go through the grocery store and just like close, close our nose and just, you know, just the whole time ears, walking down the aisles. Touch everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, explain to us some of the, uh, the the rapid prototyping element you had with this project. Uh, what, what sort of software were you using to uh, create these cones? Yeah, so the cone was first designed in SolidWorks, and then we rapid prototyped it. In, we actually did that at the Visible Futures Lab at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. And there we used, we actually prototyped it with a MakerBot first. And then we went on to use a larger format printer. And it was, what's neat about it is that you can almost make that cone in any shape that you wanted too. It's actually a neat exercise even without the sound. Is that those cones could be in different shapes. I actually have a, a spoon too that's a really fun exercise. Because you can make your own, you can make your own eating utensils using 3D technology in a really fun way. And I know that you used some 3D technology with the Soda project as well. There was a part of that project that used Autodesk's 123D Catch. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's a, a, a neat idea. We made these. Um, so the great thing about 123D Catch is that it's a software from Autodesk, which means that you can photo, you can basically do a 3D scan of any object, and you can use even something as simple as your phone to photograph around an object. And so all those pictures when you upload them into the software, they create the 3D model for you automatically. And then you can send it to different outputs like a MakerBot or a partner like Shapeways and actually get the thing printed so it's real. So a really great way to make your own food design tool is a simple trick is based, is making what I call <laughs> souvenir spoons. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're in like every truck stop <laughs> across America, right? So. The cool thing is that with 123D Catch, you can collage in 3D so easily. So what I did here was I was starting to think about it. Like a regular spoon, we pretty much hold like this. Mm, how are other ways that we could hold our eating utensils? So I found this funny, strange, I don't know, something. <laughs> but what's neat about it is that actually it, you can hold it like this. So there's a kind of a new way, a new gesture, right? So I put some sticky putty on the back of it, and then I'm going to take the spoon, and I just tack the spoon right onto it, just like that. And now what I have is I have my own hacked souvenir spoon. So the shape of it is something that I can use 123D Catch, and I can photograph around this whole spoon. What you want to do is always stabilize it in some way. right? So what I might do when I photograph this is just hang it, like hang it from a hook, so I can stabilize it and photograph all around. And then that file can get sent to 123D. And then what you can do is send that, for example, like I said, to Shapeways. Because when you print in, uh, when you rapid prototype in the plastic material, it's not food safe. You want to send it to Shapeways if you're going to eat with it and get it printed in ceramic or porcelain or something like that. But it's a really great way because now I would come out and when I get the actual thing, I have a spoon that has a hook spot on top of it. And that also lets me eat in this kind of crazy way, like, boop. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way that you see things and, and you just feel like, how can I make this different and more interesting? So that, that's really fun for me. And I also really, really love 1, 2, 3D Catch. I didn't hear about it until maybe like two years ago and I just like started playing around with it and then everything was something I could play with in my 3D environment. And 
I actually took a sculpting class, and we had only one you know, sc head to work off of. And I was like, well, I'm not going to try to walk across the classroom every time I need to look at how the nose is shaped. So I used 1230 catch, and I took a whole scan of the entire thing. And then I could just move around it on my phone at my desk. And, and it was awesome. And then everybody downloaded the app in the middle of the class. <laughs> <laughs> You're changing the world. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just such a great tool because everything is designed already, right? And now we have tools that let us do that so easily and we can start to make our own cutlery, we can make our own plates, we can make our own cups. All of that is available today. Very cool. And Shapeways, I mean, that's definitely a great way to go about it. Definitely remember if you're going to be eating to do the use food safe materials, but I mean, For sure. I'd love to see some cool stuff out there that you, you all make with, the, with that software. So yeah. check it out and, uh, and show us what you've made on the community page. It, it, be it or not, uh, some utensils, but like sculpt something in clay, you know, capture that and then 3D print it. That would be really cool. Yeah, I have a really neat one to share. I'll put it up there because you can also do stuff like you can catch your head if you want <laughs> and then stick it on top of a spoon shape. Nice. <laughs> so we have a neat spoon head uh, instructional that I'll put up there so you can see oh, how your spoons spoon. can become. Objects of the wildest universe. <laughs> that, I love it. I love that. That sounds like so much fun. Awesome. Eric, let's get your yeah. head on a spoon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> just have it there, and you know, we can just talk during breakfast, back yeah. and forth. Yeah, well, attach our spoon heads to our makey makeys and just have a really weird and awesome experience. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the doors are wide open for that. Any any sort of ideas that you have out there, or anything that you want to contribute. So that's really cool. I, that's really neat. Um, Emily, thank you so much for coming out to Maker Camp and sharing with us all these awesome projects. Um, we're going to be getting a lot of questions coming in, especially about uh, some of the work you've done here. So uh, before we get to that, we have one more message. And we're back. It's Cool Food Day, and we are chatting up with food scientist Emily Baltz. Um, counselors, I think we're going to have some questions for you. I, 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 I certainly would. So, uh, yeah, well, what do you guys have out there? Hey, counselors, you may need to unmute yourself. Yeah, just got that done. Um, this is actually a personal question of mine. How did you get into food science and gastronomy, and like, what interested you about it? Yeah, well, I'm actually, I think like Pierre, I'm half French. So my mom, I had always cooked like a French person in our house, and she would always make these really amazing meals. And they showed us that it, food could be this really magical, very, very creative place. She was always inventing new desserts, new dishes. We always had really interesting cutlery. She would collect it from all over the world. And so I started to see food as this place that also was a playground for creativity. And so when I started becoming a maker myself, that was the material that I wanted to choose. Because it was also great. It's stuff that you can make and you can share with people. You get immediate feedback. You can experiment and prototype really quickly. You don't really need that much in terms of equipment. You know, your kitchen basically has it all. So, and then as we get kind of smarter and smarter as human beings, we bring all this tech into it. And now I think the universe is pretty boundless in terms of what we can do with food. Yeah, I've seen such awesome food hacks lately. And there's, I mean, we, working at Make, we get a lot of these manuscripts that come in that are like food hacks. And I'm like, oh, I want to play with all of them. They're so cool. <laughs> so we get to occasionally we get to have some really good food at work. From, it's it's for work. It's definitely we're doing hard science here and not just <laughs> eating all the time. <laughs> Top cooking is one of the best sciences. It, it is, and it's it's a, it's an essential science. We have to have it to live, so we might as well enjoy it and be nerds about it. <laughs> hey, counselors, do we have any more questions coming in? Um, yeah, we have a question. Um, we have another question. Uh, what is um, your favorite uh, food hacker? And um, aside from design, your um, uh, your eyes are holding uh, on your nose. Aside from designing the eyes and, oh, the holding my nose thing? Yeah. Um, well, well, yeah. Aside from that, uh, what is your favorite uh, food hack? Hmm, my favorite food hack. There's another great one. 
that you can do, and this is a good, this is actually a neat little um, party trick as well. So if you ever make pudding or anything like that, what you can do is take the same thing. So you take like vanilla pudding or even whipped cream. And if you add tiny bits of food coloring to it, what you can do is do a color taste test with people. And it's a really good trick because we actually communicate so much with our eyes. So before we even eat, we look at something. And the color of that thing will communicate to us more than we know. And so if you look at a bunch of different vanilla puddings, let's say, and one is blue, and one is yellow, and one is pink, and one is orange, and one is green, a great experiment to do with your friends is to start to do a live experiment and ask them to tell you what each flavor is when they look at it, and then ask them to tell you what each flavor is when they taste it, but don't ever tell them that it's all the same flavor. And what you'll see is usually really surprising, is that people will start to assign names like different flavors to different colors, even when it actually is the same flavor, only because of the effect of our vision onto our sense of taste. So that's another really great food hack to do that's pretty simple and really fun. Really interesting. You know, I saw a really funny video where people were taking uh, macaroons that were crazy colors and try, like closing their eyes and trying to tell what flavor they were and then looking at them and trying to tell. And it would be like bright blue, and they'd be like, it's rosemary. So like, yeah. What? <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> it's, it's a really cool thing. It's really funny to watch people, especially when they're blindfolded trying to figure it out, and then they look at it and they're like, wait, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do that later as an excuse to eat some macaroons. <laughs> that is a, always, everyone always needs a macaroon excuse. Yeah, so counselors, let's get another one. The idea for the lick is drunk from. <laughs> so Carla and I always really wanted a band. <laughs> That's the simplest answer. <laughs> we always really wanted a band. And we also didn't want to change eating behavior. So one thing that was important, whenever you do any kind of experiments, is that you always want to show, don't tell. So the second that you have to say, OK, now you're going to do this, that actually gives one more step of complication. So a great design tool is try to keep the principle show, don't tell first. And the great thing with an ice cream cone is that everyone knows exactly what to do. So what do we do? We lean forward and we lick. So we don't have to tell anyone what to do. So the surprise is even bigger when you lick it and you're like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So that was part two of our choice of actually using the ice cream cone for that reason and using ice cream for that reason. Really interesting. Huh. Yeah, I guess I, everybody wow. does, and then so people have their own techniques. You know, sometimes they gotta like clean all the drips and then work their way up. So <laughs> yeah. you get to you get to really get a different sound from each person based off of how they eat their ice cream. Yeah, yeah. that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. yeah, that's a good. You know, that's a good kind of principle to use in other in other projects is that everybody will approach a problem or a situation differently. So if you give them a, an environment where the way that they approach a problem is kind of celebrated, you get really cool and unexpected results. Yeah, and everybody gets to express their individuality then. Every single liquor in the Lickistra has a unique way of licking. Mm. <laughs> I bet that that can have some really, really uh, fun sounds attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm kind of curious if our affiliate uh, at the at the Hilton Head uh, Island Club, if, if any of you guys have uh, questions, I would love to hear those. George, my name is George. I have a question. Uh, have you ever made something that you thought would taste really good but taste really bad? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. You know what? Here's a tip: don't ever put granola in a salad. <laughs> it is not a good idea. <laughs> that is some wow. <laughs> yeah, that was not a good idea. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's flying too close to the sun. I think <laughs> my, my brain went immediately to accidentally putting salt when you meant to put sugar, but that's that's, that's, that's what, what I was actually thinking, thinking too. Yeah. But the these, salt and sugar mix up. <laughs> and actually, my, when I was younger, my mom made these like cheddar biscuits, and she put them in the freezer to preserve them. And I was like, oh, those are shortbread cookies. So I stole one because I was like, this is going to be delicious. And I ate the, the biscuit, and I was expecting it to be really sweet. And it was terrible.
terribly salty and cheesy, and I was like, this is the worst cookie that's ever been made, ever. This so bad. Oh, my goodness. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> that's it actually... Taste in my mouth. Just hearing it. <laughs> what you just described, too, is the part where your eyes are telling you that it's something else. So that's part of the key when you want to make something that's delicious for people, is that the visual actually has to communicate, too. Because none of us like to be tricked, and especially with food. When we think it's going to be a yummy, sweet treat, and then it's some sort of salty, cheesy thing, those are not good surprises. <laughs> not a fun it way to go. It makes perfect sense from a biological perspective. I mean, we yeah, the species that, that evolved from making sure they could tell what foods were before they ate them. So. Exactly. All of that is part of our original programming. Our eyes would tell us if something was fresh or rotten, and that was how we were to live or die. So the same rules apply today. We just like to poke and, and play with them now. <laughs> yeah, and I'm kind of remembering seeing like some pictures on the internet of like cakes that were made that would look like, or they've made like a banana that looks like it was rotten or something, but it was actually like all fondant and painting and stuff. And so they, you look at it, you're like, that looks gross, and they taste it, and you're like, this is really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's ever, that's a, we're evolving. <laughs> And, you know, uh, I think we've got another question from Enrique. So, Enrique, uh, and he's also got the ice cream there. So, Enrique, <laughs> how's it going? You call me. Um, so, Sam is asking, do you find it more difficult to detect what the food is when other senses aren't available? Mm, yeah. I think, like we, like we did earlier, the nose pinching exercise, it's really hard to actually taste. We do have a lot of cues from texture, just like we saw Burke narrow it down to a category of stuff, right? Because we're used to some textures. But definitely without smell. And that's usually a really, that's, the, that's one of the most important scents that we have. What's also really interesting about our sense of scent is that it goes through a part of our brain called the limbic system. And the limbic system is where all of our memories are made. So that's why when we smell something, we can tell immediately, like, it brings back some kind of a memory. Scents are really, really powerful for that reason. Immediately you'll say, oh my god, that smelled like my mom making cookies or my aunt making fried chicken. So what food can also do, what our sense of smell can also do, is take us back in time to a place. And that's why people react really individually to food often. It's like, oh, I really like that flavor. Why? usually because it's taking us back to a time and a place that we've experienced that scent from. And so that's the, that's the interesting part about playing with our sense of smell, is that without it, not only can't we really don't taste, but we actually can't place ourselves in time or space. So this is one of my favorite senses. So, yeah, I've wow, definitely yeah. heard that before, that smell is directly linked Link to, to memories. So you'll walk yeah. in, you'll smell something, and be like, oh, I remember when my mom was making this when I was little, and it's... It's very a very interesting experience when that happens to you, and you're like, whoa, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> so, Enrique, how's that ice cream coming? It is actually good. We are going to test it for you guys. Uh, hopefully, we will be safe. Yeah, I think, I think it's OK. You think I think it's, it'll work out. Are, are you sure? You might want to test that one more time. <laughs> OK, good idea. Oh my goodness! Yeah, you better have saved some. Right. I'm gonna come and get some later. The music. Yeah, yeah, there's no music. That's kind of disappointing now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. They have uh, different yeah. licking strategies. This is definitely not a licking strategy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like the different techniques that you got going yeah. there. We're gonna <laughs> slowly analyze you for the rest of the day. Oh, cool. <laughs> And, you know, on that awesome note, I want to thank everybody that was around today. Emily Bobs, thank you for bringing all these fantastic, interesting experiments for us to look at, you know, really look at something that we do every day in a new light. And I also want to thank the, the Hilton Head um, Island Boys and Girls Club for being so fun and awesome and having great questions. So thank you. Thank people. <laughs> I love, I love the shirts. All of you in blue are super cool. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, they're looking sharp, but I think red is a little sharper color. Yeah, it's debatable. Um, I'd say. <laughs> All right, Brooke, so what do we have coming up tomorrow? Boy, do we have a nice, exciting show for you guys tomorrow. It is Rolling Robots Day. We're going to meet with the makers who made the fun and friendly robots over at Sphero. And you know what? If you weren't inspired by something today, 
I'm, I'm very surprised. <laughs> so remember, take all the cool stuff we talked about today and do try it at home. Goodbye, campers. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. You guys are awesome. Whoa.